Good morning, everyone. We're going to start our service at this time. Uh, just to re uh, reiterate a couple of the ground rules that we set forth uh, a few weeks ago. For the duration of the service, all members of the live Zoom call will be muted in order to keep an orderly service. This service will be recorded and posted on YouTube for members who aren't able to worship with us at this time. There is a chat function on the Zoom call, so if you have a prayer request or a need that we can help with at the appropriate time, you can uh, either privately message Bob or Vince in the chat, or you could text their phones. Uh, chat messages will not show up in the recorded service on YouTube. However, unless they are private, they will be visible to members as we live stream this morning. We are hopeful that you have the necessary materials for the Lord's Supper with you. Um, there are individual packs available in a tote in the church carport. Uh, at the appropriate time, my dad, when he leads the communion service, he will offer a prayer for the emblems and you may partake with us. I will post song lyrics on the screen while leading the song so that you may follow along. And if you're using your iPhone, you can pinch uh, your screen to zoom in and out if you need to. And while I will be the only member audible through your speakers, you are encouraged to sing along at home and know that the Lord hears all of us. After the service, we can leave the meeting open for several minutes and open the chat for some fellowship. That's been uh, very, very nice for the last few weeks. This portion will not be recorded for YouTube, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, we will be meeting this Wednesday night for a Bible study on Zoom. We'll start that this Wednesday at 7 p.m., and we're going to post links on our website. Uh, we also have our Facebook page up and running, and that is at Utica Church of Christ, 19 Mile Road, all one word. Um, we'll be studying, we'll be resuming our study of Genesis chapters 20 through 25 for this Wednesday. So if you're interested in that, we will post those links and that should be a lot of fun and very good for us. Uh, a couple congregational announcements for this week. Continue to remember Cassidy Markham, who's still suffering from ear infections. Uh, Dave Radlick, who's a friend of Vince, uh, is experiencing a recurrence of cancer. Kelly Reggie, who is a daughter of a coworker of Vince, she passed away earlier this week from COVID-19. We had her in our prayers last week. Remember the Reggie family uh, and Vince's coworker in your prayers. The Edwards family, Joey and Bridget Edwards, who are friends of the Reese family, who are also suffering with COVID-19. Remember our sister Bernice Burkeen, who fell at home and she's recovering and she's doing well in rehab, but that's it's a scary time for that right now. So remember the Burkeens in your prayers. Also, Marvin's uncle, Larry Mayberry, uh, he tested negative for COVID-19, but he is in the hospital in North Carolina, and the hospital is not a, uh, you know, it's, it's a very worrisome place to be right now. So remember the Mayberries and Marvin's uncle, Larry, in your prayers. Also, our sister, Renita, is requesting prayers on behalf of healthcare workers, and of course, we know that our healthcare workers can use all the prayers uh, that, that we can that we can offer up right now. So remember them in your prayers as well. This time we're gonna begin our service and we will start with uh, number 95. If you have a song book at home, it's number 95. I'll put the song on screen and it's He Lives. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. 
He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. At this time, we will have our opening prayer and scripture reading from our brother, Marvin. I'll switch over to you in just a second here. Uh, good morning, um, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> this morning's uh, scripture reading will come from the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 26, verses 1 through 8. Once again, that is um, Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 26, um, verses 1 through 8. And I will be reading from the NIV translation. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I have, ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I conformed to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of his word. Now let us go to God in prayer. Our precious Father in heaven, a few of your faithful servants bow just now, Father, thanking you for all things. Thanking you, Father God, for this day. You saw fit to wake us up out of our beds while we slept and we slumbered. And you gave us this day, Heavenly Father, to worship you in spirit as well as in truth. Father God, we're so thankful for your love that you um, continue to bless and watch over your children. Father, just now we are praying for the church as a whole all over the land and country, dear God. We're just asking Heavenly Father that we would um, not show fear, dear God, any anxieties, dear God, for the circumstances that our world is in today. But Heavenly Father, may we be a light to all those that look upon us, dear God. May we show the strength, show the faith that we have in a Father that is still in control. We realize, Heavenly Father, that some of, my, our, some of our members may have even contracted COVID, dear God. But we just pray for them, dear God, that their faith not fail not. We pray that you would heal them. Um, and we just pray for all those who may be, may be affected, dear God. Be with those um, frontline workers, dear God, the, the caregivers, those who put um, their lives on the line, Father, to help. We just ask that you would bless them, um, encourage them, strengthen them, protect them, Father God. We pray for all of us, dear God, all of our members, our elderly members, dear God, uh, everyone that is in the sound of my voice. We just pray that you would be with each and every one of us, Heavenly Father, as our goal this day is to worship you in spirit and in truth, to come together collectively, Father, um, and we await for the word from your manservant, Brother Bryant. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would just continue to be with us all, continue to be with Bryant, Father, and his family, be with Robin, all those in need of prayer, Father. We just pray for um, this service. We pray that those brethren who will um, 
render this service, Father, would do it to the best of their abilities, Father. And we just ask that you would be with us through the furtherance of this service. Everything that we say and do be to your honor and your glory. And please, Father, forgive us for any sin that we have committed, Father, either by omission or commission. Just strengthen us and have us to be better Christians today than we were yesterday. This is our prayer that we ask in the glorious name of our Lord, Savior, and Master, Jesus Christ, that the church say amen. Amen. Before our uh, Lord's Supper this morning, my dad will lead that. We're going to sing, Low in the Grave He Lay. Oh, in the grave he lay, Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus, my up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Vainly watch his bed, Jesus, my Savior. Vainly they seal the dead, Jesus, my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Death cannot keep his prey. Jesus, my Savior, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to my dad, who will lead us in our Lord's Supper. morning. As we gather around the table, I'd like to read from you, read to you from the book of Luke, chapter 22, starting with verse 15. So he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. 
We have this awesome opportunity on the first day of the week to gather around this table and commune with our Lord. At this time, I'm going to ask you to peel back the first layer. If you're using these, exposing the bread. And please bow with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful, dear Lord, for this opportunity we have to gather around this table together like this. Commune with you, dear Lord, in this way together. We are so thankful for your son, his desire to do your will, dear Lord. We are so thankful that the love for the love that was shown to us, dear Lord. We pray that as we partake of this bread that we will indeed focus on the body, the body of our Lord and Savior that was hung on that cross for our sins, dear Lord. We pray that we will realize that it's that sacrifice that gives us the awesome opportunity to spend eternity with you. We pray that as we partake of this bread that we will do it in a manner well-pleasing in your sight. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would now peel the second layer, exposing the cup, bow with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we continue our prayer now for this fruit of the vine. We pray, dear Lord, as we partake of this cup that we will understand that it is your son's blood that was shed for us, dear Lord, that cleanses us daily. We pray, dear Lord, that we'll realize that Without this blood, we have no chance. No chance to spend eternity with you. No chance to spend eternity in heaven. We pray that as we partake of this cup, dear Lord, we will understand the sacrifice that was made for us. That we realize, dear Lord, that we are cleansed daily by this blood and we are so thankful for that. We pray, dear Lord, as we partake of this cup, that we'll do it in a manner well-pleasing in your sight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, we also have the awesome opportunity to give. We are commanded to give. And, and I read to you before from uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. I'm going to read that again. And I just want to focus a little bit on the word the. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so must you do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by something, storing it up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. I want to just focus a little bit today on that word, the, on the first day of the week. When we, when we purchase something that we have to take out a loan for and the bank says on the first day of the month that note will be due, there's, there's no question in our mind that it's every month. And in the same way where it says here on the first day of the week, it doesn't say on the first day of a week, meaning any random week. It says on the first day of the week, meaning every first day of every week. And so we as Christians, we understand that. And I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about that today as we lay by in store. We this is the time during our worship when we do it, and uh, it is very important. It is a command, and we should all be ready to lay by in store, whether 
your method of getting it to the building is, is using the, the PayPal app that's on our website or mailing it or, or just connecting with someone and dropping it off there. The point is right now is the time to lay by and store on the first day of the week. And we're gonna do that together right now. Would you pray, pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful, dear Lord, for all the many blessings you give us each and every day. We are thankful, dear Lord, for this opportunity to be together like this, to gather around your table, to pray together, to sing together. We are thankful, dear Lord, for the opportunity to give together, dear Lord. We pray that as we lay by in store that the money collected will be used in a way that will bring glory unto your name and further your kingdom here on earth, dear Lord. We pray that this money collected is, is dispersed in a responsible manner. We pray that you will guide the hands that collect it and guide the hands that disperse it, dear Lord, that everything we do in your service will be done in a way that brings glory into your name, dear Lord. All these things we pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. This time before our sermon, we're going to sing, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. He wills that I should wholly be in word and thought indeed. Then I his holy face may see when from this earth life freed. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that unto sinful men his saving grace is nigh. I know that he will come again to take me home on high. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that over yonder stands a place prepared for me. A home, a house not made with hands most wonderful to see. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to our brother, Brian, who will bring us the message this morning. I want to say good morning to you, wherever you are. If you're listening today and worshiping with us, I want to say good morning to you. Um, it is wonderful for us to be here, even in this format. It's, again, difficult and different, but um, we adapt in order to serve our God. Uh, we have 
a lot of ground to cover this morning. We will talk to you this morning from the subject, what's so incredible about the resurrection? What's so incredible about the resurrection? And um, I trust that we all have our Bibles with us today because we're going to cover a bit of quite a bit of ground. Uh, and so we're going to ask at this time, if you would, go with me to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Again, Father, we do thank you and we do praise you for all that you've given to us and all that you think that you blessed us with. We thank you for all of your blessings. We thank you for above all for your son, our savior, Jesus, the Christ who you gave to us out of your great love, Lord, who has made it possible uh, and who is the object of this worship. We pray now that as we study your word, that uh, our minds are focused and our hearts are receptive and that we have prepared our hearts through meekness to receive your word, knowing that it has the ability to save our souls. We pray that we are learning more and more every day the value of looking past the speaker with his weaknesses and his failings and looking to you, knowing that all that is good and right and true and eternal belong to you and all the mistakes belong to the speaker. These things we pray and ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. One of the challenges of preaching on this particular day on our calendar uh, is understanding that historically and doctrinally we have no apostolic record given to the church of observing the resurrection of our Lord Jesus the Christ annually. We do however when we look at the scriptures we do however have record that the first century church observed and commemorated the Lord's sacrifice and his death every first day of the week, which is what we uh, participated in just a few moments ago. We know this from Acts chapter 20, verse 7, the tradition and the habit of the first century church. And since we have been baptized into his death and have been raised to walk in newness of life, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. By considering ourselves dead to sin, we have to understand that we display our faith in his resurrection and our hope that we will be raised when he comes back every day. Romans chapter 6, verses 5 through 11. In other words, we live the resurrection every day by considering ourselves dead to sin. The resurrection of Jesus the Christ is the foundation of the Christian's hope, and it is the heart of the gospel message that saves the sinner. And so we are all right understanding uh, the significance or the lack thereof in terms of the calendar and what this day means to many. We are still, because of the gospel message, all right, and we are really more than all right when we look at the resurrection on an occasion like this for those who would be themselves observing the resurrection because it again is the foundation of our hope and it saves the sinner. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the reason why the apostle Paul was imprisoned in this passage of scripture that you and I heard read to us this morning. And we find that the apostle Paul at this time was in Caesarea because of the preaching of the gospel imprisoned. And in this particular passage, we see that Paul's dedication to the message of the gospel allowed him to speak to men of all kinds. We see the Apostle Paul speaking to men all over the world. And now in this passage of scripture that we're studying this morning, Paul stands before the governor of Judea, Festus. He stands before King Agrippa and his wife Bernice, and the Jewish council, and many others. And so we ask you, again, to open your Bibles, and, uh, and giving just a little context, we look at verses 4 through 8, where we will draw our lesson. The Bible says in Acts chapter 26, verses 4 through 8, it says, as Paul is speaking, these are the words in part of Paul, he says, all the Jews know my way of life from my youth, a life spent from the beginning among my own people and in Jerusalem. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that I have belonged to the strictest sect of our religion 
and lived. Paul said, I lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial on account of my hope in the promises, in the promise made by God to our ancestors. Our ancestors, a promise that our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship day and night. It is for this hope, your excellency, that I am accused by Jews. Now I want you to look at verse eight because Paul, he says something powerful here. He says, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises from the dead? I want just for a few moments to think about this concept of really a couple of concepts, but we'll start with the concept of the incredible. Because the, the concept of the incredible has to do with and is in relation to the concept of credibility. It is a concept that denotes the idea of contradiction, a contradiction of reason. It has to do with the idea of something that is void of, of fact. The concept of that which is credible has to do with those things that are rational. It has to do with things that are rational because it has been predicted because it is analogous to and harmonious with experience because it is morally, someone has said it is morally and practically serviceable to humanity, that which is credible. So when we look at Paul's question, when we think about Paul's question, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises from the dead? When you think about it, it really is a powerful question. It's a powerful statement by Paul inspired of the Holy Spirit. It's powerful, brothers and sisters, because it confronts the ideas, the philosophies, the thoughts, as you see Paul describes, that everyone present on that day that Paul initially spoke, that they had in their minds. It really challenged everyone 2,000 years ago in the first century. But not only that, as well as it confronted the philosophies of men on that day, it also confronts the philosophies of men today in the 21st century. It challenges, Paul's question does, the atheist. It challenges the skeptic. It challenges the one that questions, that believes in God, but questions his abilities, it, that questions his love. And so when we look at this, this idea that Paul poses to all, we want to just talk as many as we could, we're gonna just pose to you three things to think about. We want you to consider, again, listen to Paul's question. Why is it incredible to any of you that God raises from the dead? We wanna to pose to you three, three reasons why this is so. The first reason that some believe it's incredible or something that lacks credibility that God raises from the dead is because of the teachings of men. The reason why men think that it is incredible that God raises from the dead is because of what men teach. Some would deem the reality of the resurrection incredible because they are influenced by other men, those given authority to teach others. Now, some of us that, that are listening today may consider that all that profess to be in Christ, that all such people believe in the resurrection. You probably are saying in your mind, who is it that professes to believe in Christ that does not believe in the resurrection of Christ? And I say to you that there are many. Consider the believers in Corinth. And I want you to, to in your mind's eye, to think about this, this uh, thought that I pose to you. Think about the church in Corinth and those particular believers. Think about how at that time of Paul's writing to them, his first letter as we know it, that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus had only occurred approximately a little more than two decades ago. When Paul writes, in other words, his letter to the Corinthians, it had only been about 20 something or so years. This glorious event was so recent 
to the Corinthians time that many of those that witnessed the resurrected Lord's appearance were still alive, that Paul knew. We know this from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6. Paul talked about how over 500 men were still alive that had witnessed the, the appearance of the resurrected Lord. And even though these particular believers in Corinth had received the gospel message, and even though they had obeyed the gospel, these same believers that even though they lived in a different part of the world where the Lord was resurrected, these Corinthians still lived during the Lord's, the days of the Lord's resurrection. But nevertheless, they were beginning to doubt whether or not there was even a resurrection of the dead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 19, Paul makes an argument, and when he makes this glorious argument, this, when he raises it, he wants these believers to consider the implications of denying that there is a resurrection from the dead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12, this is what Paul says. He says, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain. And your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished, Paul says. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ. In other words, if, if Paul says, if it's all about just this life that we have believed in these things, we are all of most people to be pitied. Powerful. See, in other words, if there is no resurrection, Paul says, then Christ himself was not raised, and he does not sit at the right hand of God's majesty. And since, brothers and sisters, everything that we do, everything that we say is anchored in the hope of his resurrection, then if there is no resurrection, then Paul makes the claim and he makes the statement, powerful statements, that there are many reasons why living as a Christian is fruitless. He says that it's in vain for us to even live as Christians if we have no hope of ourselves being raised. See, all of this was necessary for Paul to say, since many of them were beginning again to believe that there is no resurrection. And the reason is because, again, there was someone that was teaching them. See, there is a reason, brothers and sisters, that when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I know that we like to, and, and that's okay that we pick aspects of Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we pull it apart in order to make biblical points and to raise biblical arguments. But we have to understand that the Apostle Paul, it was in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, that the Apostle Paul said these words. He urges them, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. In other words, Paul was implying that they were allowing those who were erroneous in their beliefs, erroneous in their doctrine, erroneous in their teaching to influence them. Bad teachers, false teachers are the reason why men today, just like in Paul's day, believe it incredible that God raises from the dead. See, remember, some of the brethren that Paul even knew in his life, that Paul himself had an influence once, that Paul had helped to obey the gospel. Some of these brothers that Paul referred to in other letters began to deviate from the truth themselves. In 2 Timothy chapter number two, I want you to consider what Paul says about individuals that he himself knew. And as he urges Timothy to be a faithful preacher of the gospel, even encouraging Timothy to hold on to that which he had attained. In 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verses 16 through 18, listen to what Paul says to Timothy. He says, avoid profane chatter. 
for it will lead people into more and more impiety. In other words, fruitless talk, fruitless discussions will only lead people into greater and greater uh, impiety. And their talk, Timothy, will spread like gangrene. And then he mentions two individuals that has fallen to this. He says, among them are Hermanius and Philetus. Now look at their doctrine. Paul plainly tells what their teaching was. He says, they have swerved from the truth by claiming they were teaching that the resurrection had already taken place. He says that they are upsetting the faith of some. See, brothers and sisters, what I'm saying to you is, is this, is that if those that were so closely, again, think about those believers in Corinth and how closely they were associated in time to the resurrection themselves. And if those that were so closely related in time to the actual resurrection of the Lord Jesus themselves began to doubt, if they could doubt, is it possible for us today in the Lord's church to doubt ourselves in the resurrection? And of course the answer is yes. See, there are some today that have become ignorant concerning the Lord and his patience toward us, just like they did in the first century. There are individuals who, who look at the patience of the Lord and as time has progressed and since in their mind they say, it's been over 2000 years that man has waited for the return of the Lord. And they lack the, the, the understanding of the Lord's patience. They have become ignorant with the Lord's love towards man. And since they say he has not returned, they believe that the Lord's resurrection is not of reality. They have taken it them, upon themselves to re-examine the scriptures concerning his coming. And this quote unquote re-examination of the scriptures has given birth to the belief that our traditional understanding that we receive from the scriptures, our traditional understanding of the Lord's return is incorrect. A bodily and a physical return, they believe is wrong. There are some, in other words, that believe that the resurrection, it, 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 as we know it, it, will not take place, that the resurrection takes place when every person dies. And that time since it has gone on and on for over 2,000 years, that it will continue to go on. People really, even in our brotherhood, and many in the church have been led astray. There is a reason, brothers and sisters, that Paul concludes this powerful thought concerning the resurrection as he does in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, when he says to the believers there to be steadfast. What is he talking about? In their reception of the gospel, in their hope of the resurrection, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know your labor is not in vain. So we know that 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 talks about the Lord's return. But we need to hold on to this hope that one day we will see him in the clouds and he will take us to be with himself and so shall we be with him forevermore. The first reason that men believe it incredible that God raises from the dead is because of the teachings, the erroneous teachings of men. But number two, the second reason why men believe this is because some fail to envision a world superior to this earthly world. Let me say that again. The reason why some in the 21st century believe it incredible that the Lord raises from the dead is because they fail to envision a world superior to this earthly one. I want us for this moment to consider the full thought behind Paul's statement. Don't just take it at face value. Just look at, at, at all that is ingratiated in Paul's statement here. Was Paul's objective simply to bring all of his listeners that day to the point where they simply acknowledged that the Lord had the power to raise? In other words, did Paul go through everything that he did just so that he would hear King Agrippa or the governor Festus or all of the Jews just simply acknowledge that God's power, that God had the power to raise from the dead, you know, you and I know that that is not the case. We know that Paul had a greater intention, a greater objective, a greater aim, since we even know that many in his audience themselves believed in the resurrection. 
not of the Lord Jesus, but in the resurrection, generally speaking. So Paul's statement, this powerful question, was a response to all of his listeners' rejection of his message and the promises embodied in the good news. In the minds of Paul's audience, they could not reconcile the idea that God would compensate and that God could compensate Paul or that God would re reward Paul with a new life that reflected the sufferings that Paul willingly submitted to. It's powerful when you think about it. See, in other words, they looked at Paul's life and they said that based upon all that this man has gone through, based upon the hope that this man has, whatever he's aiming for, whatever he is looking to receive, it cannot be equated with what this man has, has been willing to go through. In other words, they thought that it was foolish for Paul to place such a great hope in a message and in promises that required him to give his life. I want you to, to just think about the idea that, that when Agrippa saw Paul, there was a level of pity. He believed in many of the scriptures, but there was a pity that, that he had when he looked at Paul and Festus, who himself, if you continue to read, he himself exclaimed that, Paul, you are out of your mind. Too much learning has driven you insane. And even the Jews looked at Paul with a certain condescension because of what he was willing to, to give his life over to. You have to remember, brothers and sisters, that at this time, Paul had been in prison for more than two years. And he eagerly, there was no complaining, there was no grumbling. Paul eagerly waited for his defense, to make his defense of the gospel. And these individuals certainly believed that this hope that Paul was waiting for, that Paul preached about, that Paul gave his life to, they certainly believed that it was not worth it. And so it is today. Men devalue and minimize the Christian's hope today. People in your life look at you and they minimize this, this hope that you have within you. Many people in the world, for example, consider Jesus's words in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26. They look at these words. And I'm going to ask you again to turn there. In Matthew chapter number 16, consider these words that Jesus talks and gives concerning his disciples. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, the Bible says, Then Jesus told his disciples if any and in other words it's a requirement of all that would follow him if any want to become my followers let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me for those who want to save their life will lose it and those who lose their life for my sake will find it for what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? See, what I'm saying to you is, is that when people look at this particular passage of scripture and they consider this demand that the Lord makes on his disciples, they see this sacrifice and this genuine disciple dedication that the Lord calls us to. They don't see it uh, as something that is worth the hope that, that is within us. They look at it and they see it as a, as a demand by the Lord Jesus that is too difficult. Or in Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 39, where the Lord tells his disciples that they must choose between an allegiance and a loyalty to him and to his word over even those that are most closest to them in this life. People look at those words by the Lord Jesus and they consider that these words are too extreme. And when they compare it to the hope that they find in the scripture, they believe that it's just too difficult to obey. Or God's standard of holiness in 1 Peter chapter number 1, verses 13 through 17, where Peter talks about that the standard of holiness is that as our heavenly Father is holy, we also are called to be holy. Or in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17, all the way into chapter 5, verses 1 through 20, where Paul, by inspiration, talks about what you and I are, as Christians are called to do and the holy life in which 
we are to pursue. Many people look at that and when they examine what Christians are called to do and what demands the Lord places on us, they look at them as too radical and too lofty. And they consider it that this life that Christians are called to, they consider it a robbery of the pleasures of this world. Or our Lord's call, brothers and sisters, to endure suffering for the sake of his name. Revelation chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, and really throughout the entire New Testament scriptures, when people consider that Jesus himself was abused but did not return abuse, and that he requires the same of those that would call themselves to be his followers, his disciples, those that would bear his name, people look at that and they say that this is just foolish. In other words, what I'm saying to you that when people in the world, many people in the world, look at the, the life of Christians. And when they consider Christianity, they believe that Christianity is too high a price for an invisible hope. This is why even some people that profess to be Christians appear so lukewarm in their faith because they have themselves not given their entire heart to the Lord Jesus. They don't serve him with their whole life. Now, yes, it is true that they would accept God's eternal inheritance if they were able to give God very little in exchange for it. If they could just serve God with a, a spirit of lukewarmness and just offer to God mediocrity and still receive their glorious inheritance, they would gladly exchange these things for that inheritance. But to meet God's demand for eternal life, to many is too high a price. It's like Israel in Numbers chapter 13. And if you're familiar with Numbers chapter 13, then you know that is, this is a passage of scripture where God was, was bringing Israel through the leadership this time of Moses, bringing them into the land of promise. And so God uh, commands Moses to send 12 spies into the land of promise, into the land of Canaan, and to, in other words, check the land out. God had promised them that it was a land that would be their possession based on his promises to Abraham. God described this land as flowing with milk and honey. And so God commands Moses to send 12 spies into the land. I propose to you that out of these 12 spies, that it was a division of, of two types of thinking. Joshua and Caleb were men of faith, men that were ready to receive that hope that God had given to them. But those 10 spies were faithless, the Bible teaches us. And so after a, a lengthy period of time, the Bible tells us that these men come back to Moses to give their report. And while Joshua and Caleb says, it's everything that the Lord said, we ought to go and just take the land. It's, it's good. Remember the words of those 10 spies. Now, I propose to you that it was not out of fear that they said that they're, it's like they're giants there. Yes, the, 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 the grapes and the fruit is wonderful, but they're like giants. And we seem as just little folk to them, small to them. It's not because that they were afraid. The reality is, is that those 10 spies devalued that glorious inheritance that God promised to his people. And when they came back, they gave an unfavorable report and placed fear in the hearts of the congregation. And there are many people like this today, that when they look at the hope that God has promised to the world and to the Christian, really, and to those that would believe, they deem it as not worth it. In Acts chapter 13, verse 46, Paul described such people as unworthy of eternal life. But faith, remembers the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter number 8, verses 18 through 25, where Paul powerfully reminds all of us, saying these glories and these eternal words, Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25. Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with an eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own, but 
by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. Again, look at verse 18. Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this world, this present time, are not worthy or worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. See, people of faith know that it's worth it because there is an imperishable and an incorruptible body that awaits us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 53. Christians and people of faith know that it's worth it because forever we are promised that we will one day be in the presence of our Lord forever. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. That we have a home free of sorrow and suffering and pain waiting for us. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. A home where righteousness and justice prevail. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. A beautiful place that is lovely to the eye. Revelation chapter 21, verses 9 through 21. A place where there will be no need for social distancing, brother. Brothers and sisters, Jesus says in John chapter 14, uh, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me and my Father's house are many dwelling places or many rooms. We will be able to be close to one another and handle one another. There will be no need for social distancing there. A place to worship our great God and the Lamb. Revelation chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. And where the gates, as we sing so wonderfully and gloriously, where the gates swing outward never. Revelation 21. Verses 22 through 27. Heaven indeed and the resurrection that we will experience will be worth it all. The second reason why men deem it incredible that God raises from the dead, simply put and powerfully put, is because they devalue the life of the Christian. And then finally and very quickly, the last reason that this is so is because that there is a lack of knowledge of God's power. There is a lack of knowledge of God's power. Of course, this is the same spirit that produced the belief in the Sadducees. Many of them were in the audience that when Paul spoke some 2,000 years ago. So Paul addressed their idea and their thinking as well. But today, men not only reject the resurrection, but all of the miracles contained in the biblical record. And so they reject God altogether. But if one would act honestly, if men would approach the scriptures sincerely with the evidence God has given man concerning his existence, if men honestly and sincerely started there, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter one, the Bible says that God has revealed it to all. If men sincerely approached him and started with God's existence, then it becomes possible for man to believe that this same God that was capable and that is capable of speaking the worlds, this vast and this glorious world and the universe and all of the universes that exist into existence by a single word, if there is a God that is capable of this, then certainly God is capable of raising men from the dead. You've probably noticed during this virus that many times the ideas of hope and and faith have been mentioned, whether by our president or by others. And almost without fail, statements by others are made concerning science and evidence. I want you to, to, to notice that. The reality is that men believe that in order for a person to be a, an, an individual of faith, excuse me, in order to be an individual of faith, one has to expel the concepts and the truths of science and evidence and reason. But remember the words of the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the evidence or the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. But in conclusion, I want to give you very quickly two things to consider concerning God's power. Think about the fact that the Bible teaches that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. Right in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul talks about Jesus as the first fruits. In other words, Jesus is proof of what God has promised. Jesus is proof of what God is capable of. Paul says, but in fact, Christ has been raised. Paul suspends this idea that, that there is no resurrection in verse 20 by saying, but in fact, 
Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Two analogies. Number one, notice an analogy concerning harvest time. And then number two, an analogy that has to do with the military, where Jesus, in other words, ranks ahead of all. And so he had to be first. But we ought to, as a world and as a society, look at what God has done through his son Jesus as the first fruits and know the capable powers of our great God. And then finally, in terms of God's power, very simply put, an old argument, but a powerful one, resurrection is not God's greatest work. Resurrection is not God's greatest display of his power, brothers and sisters. Augustine, the thinker, stated it like this. He says, it is a greater work, a greater expression of God's power, or really power of any degree, to make that which is not than to repair that which is or already exists. In other words, it was more power for God to create man than to resurrect him. See, the one who accomplishes the first, brothers and sisters, can very easily and certainly do the other. Consider the words and the worlds, should we say, that our God has fashioned. When we think about this thought of the Apostle Paul, why is it incredible that any of you, and by any of you, that God raises the dead? It's a question to all of us. And so if you are listening today, we urge you to ask yourself this question and respond honestly. If you have not obeyed the gospel, won't you obey the gospel today through faith, repentance, confession, and being baptized into Christ? for the remission of your sins. God promises upon your obedience to the gospel that he will give you the crown of life on that day when he comes back to receive his own to himself, provided you walk faithfully unto death. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. And if you are a Christian and there are things heavy on your heart, won't you make these things known right now while we turn it back over to our brother Matthew. This time, if you have any need you can you can message uh, my dad Bob or Vince uh, you can text them or you can put it in the chat and we will uh, we will honor that prayer request we're going to sing redeemed which I will put up on the screen at this time Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. We are so happy that you decided to worship with us today.
Uh, we are very happy if you are visiting with us that you chose to worship with us and we are acknowledging you at this time. I'm going to turn it over in just a moment here to Vince who's going to offer up our closing prayer. Afterwards, I will open up the microphone so that we can all talk with one another and of course wish each other a happy Easter and uh, just be one with another. I'm gonna turn it over to Vince at this time. Will you bow with me? <clears throat> Father, Holy Father, we come before you at this time, Father, giving you thanks for the many ways that you provide for us. At this time, Father, of healing, of illness, we ask, Father, that you may be the source of our strength, our courage, and patience, Father. May we join ourselves more closely to you on the cross. And that in your suffering, that through them, we may draw our patience and hope. The Father, heal those who are sick with the virus. May they regain their strength and health. Be with the families of those who are sick, and the family or those who have died as they worry and grieve, Father. Keep them safe from illness and despair. May they know your peace. We the doctors and nurses, researchers, and all the medical professionals who seek to heal and help those affected by them. May they know your protection and peace. Father, we, we are just so blessed, so grateful, Lord, that often we, you know, we forget that, you know, we might feel inconvenience. We may have no risk factor. Remember those who are most vulnerable. <clears throat> we pray that, Father, that as we are concerned about our health, our home, there's those that don't have a home. We rather pray that as we strive to draw closer to you, Lord, we don't allow the current times to distract us. We are thankful for your son. We are thankful, Father, for him dying on our behalf. As today, the world celebrates this event of his resurrection, Father. We celebrate that each and every day of our lives. We know that through his blood, through his sacrifice on that cross, we have now hope of eternal life with you. We are thankful, Father, for the message that was delivered. We pray for all those that were, that joined us and that attended the service. We pray that you keep every one of them safe. We pray that you be with those that are in need of medical health, pray with, you are with those that are, have not given their life to you, Father, that you will show your love and kindness and patience. And we pray that during this time, it will be a time where they can reflect upon their life and what's important, that this journey through this world, it's a temporary one, Father. We thank you for our brother, Brian. We thank you for, Brother Matthew for conducting the administrative side of this uh, service. And we pray that you continue to encourage and strengthen them, Father. These things we ask and pray for in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>